Learning SQL sometimes is a bit hard, especially if you're starting off and you're not too sure what exactly it does. Now, if you want a career in data analytics or data science, or even a career that somehow deals with databases, you are going to have to know SQL. And I'm going to be the first to admit, at the start, I didn't like SQL that much. But once you understand the core concepts of SQL fully, it actually tends to be quite a nice programming language. So that's what we're going to do in this video. I'm going to go over some foundational basics of SQL. We're going to figure out why should you use SQL? What is SQL? When should you use it? No SQL versus SQL. And we're also going to be building some SQL queries. So yes, there is a sort of tutorial in this video. Okay. That's what we're going to do, so let's get to it. So SQL stands for Structured Query Language, and it was invented in the 1970s. But you don't need to know that, because not once in my career did someone ask me when was a programming language invented. Anyway, when you see the letters SQL, most people pronounce it as SQL. Some people say SQL as well. To be honest, nobody cares. We all know what you're speaking about when you say SQL or SQL. But whenever you think of SQL, think databases. And when I mean databases, think storage of data. Now your data can be stored through many service providers, Amazon AWS, we can use Aurora and Redshift, Google BigQuery, Snowflake, Postgres, MS SQL Server, etc., etc. Now they all use SQL or some version of SQL. So, Let's take it simply and I'll explain to you why we need SQL. So let's just say I have a table of 10 million rows and this table has all of my activity online ever. So whatever I do online, it tracks it. So if I log on to social media, if I view someone's profile, if I post a video, etc. So this table will look something like this. Now this table would be stored in a cloud database. And what if I wanted to find out how much time I spent online in the month of September? I would need to ask the table a question, maybe something like this. Hey, table, can you tell me how much time I spent online in September? And then the table would answer, you spent 1.2 million seconds in September, which um, makes sense. And then I say, okay, table, can you tell me how much time I've spent in September in hours, not in seconds? And then table answers, you spent 360 hours online in September. Now those questions that I've asked the table or the data are known as queries. And you can see the queries that I've asked aren't too complicated. They're just a few words in a sentence. Similar, SQL queries are based on the English language and they're supposed to be somehow simple like that. And that's why SQL is good because it is a structured query language. You get to ask the data questions, manipulate the data, etc., to get it into a result that you want. Now we don't only need to ask the table or the data questions. SQL can do other things. The most common thing that SQL SQL does is query. That means it fetches data from your database along with any specific conditions or filters you may have wanted. So me saying, hey table, can you tell me how much time I spent online in September? Basically that means that I want to see my time spent and I just want to see data related to September. So when we fetch data from a database, it's known as a database query language. And it only uses one command, which is select. Out of interest, the select statement I would use to determine how much time I spent online in September would look something like this. Now, other than query the data or the tables, I can also do things to the table. So for instance, maybe I want to create a table where I have a list of all my devices I have ever owned. I would use something like the create command and the create command would look something like this. So you can see there's a create table and then devices is the table name. I then list the columns that I want. So device ID, name, owner, and then the column type, which is integer, varchar, that's variable characters. And then that would create a table that can look something like this. But maybe I wanted to remove tables or even remove databases. I can set up a query that looks like this. So this would drop the whole activity database. And there can be many tables in the database. If I run this command, it will drop everything. It will just remove everything. But maybe I want to add an additional column to a table. The column can be a varchar, which is basically just string. Then I would use the alter command. It would look something like this. Here I'm telling SQL to alter the table called devices and add a column called store bought and the column type is varchar, which means it's just a bunch of strings. Or finally, maybe I just want to empty out the table, start again. 
you can use something like a truncate command. Example would be this. So these four commands, create, drop, alter, and truncate are known as DDL. It stands for data definition language and usually helps you define your database structure or your schemas. Now, what if I wanted to insert rows or records to my table? Maybe I actually wanted to add one more device to my devices table that I created. I would use the command insert to insert a record and it would look like this. This is where I insert a record or a row into the table devices. So the columns would be device ID, name and owner, and the values are four for device ID, AirPods for name and owner is D. It would look something like this, but maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I need to update device ID number four so that the owner is John. I can use an update statement. It would look something like this. So I'm telling the data I need to update the table devices where I need to set the owner to be John where the device ID equals four. So now my table would look like this. And then if I ever needed to delete a row or some rows, I would use the delete command. So maybe I just wanna show my devices and not any of John's devices. Then my SQL statement would look something like this. And then this would remove any devices that belong to owner John. And this is known as DML, which is data manipulation language. And the common commands here are insert, update, and delete. Now there are other commands such as the ability to grant and revoke certain permissions to specific users. These are known as DCL commands, data control language. And these are just useful to give any rights or permissions. You also get something called TCL, which is transaction control language. And these commands deal with the transactions within a database. You can use a command like commit to save all transactions to a database or rollback, which rolls back any unsaved changes. But as a data analyst, the common ones you would be using is DQL, DDL, and DML. So now that we know a bit more about SQL and what it does, why is it beneficial? SQL is high performance. SQL's performance is pretty good even with large data and heavy usage. And it's really proven to work well in complex databases. SQL is also accessible. As we know, it's compatible with a lot of databases, a lot of service providers. We have Microsoft SQL Server, we can have Oracle Database, MySQL, Azure, BigQuery, Snowflake, etc. Most databases have SQL support, as well as they come with other additional features. The good thing about SQL as well is that it's quite scalable. You can create new tables, you can build tables of views off of existing tables, you can create and duplicate databases, etc. It's just easy to scale up or even scale down. SQL also has great security features. We did speak earlier about allowing users only specific rights or permissions, and this ensures a secure database. And lastly, which is probably one of the most important things, is that SQL is actually easy to learn. If you just want to retrieve and analyze data, it's not too bad to pick up SQL. In fact, it may be one of the easier languages to learn. Now, I wanted to quickly touch on relational databases because I'm sure you would have heard of this when researching SQL. SQL is a language that is used to communicate with data stored in relational database management systems. It's a fancy way of saying that this database stores tables and the tables can be linked or related to one another. It can be referred to as a relationship sometimes. And with relational databases, it just uses a model that organizes your data into tables, which consists of rows or records and columns or fields. Sometimes they're also called attributes, which basically means SQL uses tables. And these tables, like I mentioned earlier, can be linked using keys. And each row in a table is identified using a unique key called a primary key. So in this example, we have the customer's table and it has a primary key called custom ID. Why? Because each customer ID is unique. Each row consists of a unique customer. So that's why your customer ID would be unique. Your primary key can be added to another table and then it becomes a foreign key. So let's look at the orders table. The primary key here is order ID because one row in the orders table represents a unique order ID. If you have two of the same order IDs appearing in your orders table, well, something went horribly wrong. So the order ID is a primary key. It will be unique. But the customer ID is a foreign key. Firstly, the customer ID is a primary key on the customer table. And the customer ID in your order table doesn't need to be unique because the same customer can make multiple orders if you think about it. If you own an online shop, one customer can order 
multiple times in the year. So the customer ID appearing in the orders table will actually be called a foreign key. And you can see here that the foreign key appears twice in the orders table. And this primary key foreign key relationship forms the basis of how our relational databases work. So let's talk about NoSQL now that we understand what SQL is and also what relational databases is. So NoSQL databases are actually non-relational database management systems. It doesn't require a fixed schema, meaning that it doesn't need keys. It's not a tabular structure. Data is actually stored in a JSON format. And when I say JSON format, it looks like this. So whenever you think of JSON format, that's how it looks like. So to give you an example, when you retrieve something from a SQL database, which is a relational database, it looks like this. However, when you retrieve something from a NoSQL database, it looks like this. Now, what are the benefits of NoSQL? Because, you know, it does look a bit complicated, but you can pretty much see the benefits here. The data is flexible and you don't need that specific relation. It's also good for huge volumes of data. Now, if you've heard of MongoDB, MongoDB is a NoSQL database, and there are many others. In terms of popularity and which one is used more, I do think SQL is still king here. It's still the most popular, but NoSQL is definitely increasing in terms of popularity because it just works so well with big data. So definitely something to keep an eye on. So now we are going to do a mini SQL tutorial on how you can build SQL queries. For that, I'm going to go to the editor in W3Schools. The link is in the description if you want to follow along. I'm just going to cover a simple tutorial on how you build a SQL query. We're going to cover select statements, filtering and where clauses, grouping and aggregations, and even joining. Okay, so let's practice with some SQL. So I'm at the W3Schools editor and I'll post the link on the description, but this is the link here as well. And we are going to be playing around with some SQL queries. Now, if you're on a SQL editor, like a MySQL Workbench or Snowflake or Redshift, etc., you would see what tables are present in your database. So in the W3Schools tutorial, in their SQL editor, these are the tables that are present. There's some customer tables with customer information. We have categories, employees, order details, orders, products, shippers, suppliers. And what we're going to do is insert our statements here and click run and it will show us output, which is very similar to how it's done in an IDE. Okay, so I am going to backspace this. And for starters, let's just see what the data is in the orders table. So I am going to introduce a select statement and I'm going to say star and star just means show me everything. And once you add a select statement, you always follow it with a from because we need to know where are we selecting the data from and our table name. So our table is just orders. You can just use small case and click run. Cool. This is our first SQL statement and it's a select statement just showing us the first few hundred rows and we can have a look at how the table looks. Now, what if I don't want to see all the columns? Maybe I just want to see the order ID, the customer ID, and the order date. Well, we can change the statement. So instead of select star, we can actually add the columns. So I'm going to add order ID, comma, customer ID, comma, order date. You always separate your columns with commas, except the column just before the from. Okay, so the last column doesn't get a comma, if it follows a from and click run. Cool. So now we can just see the columns that we wanted from the orders table. All right, now let's go to a customers table. So backspace that and just say select star from customers. And you can see when I type in my SQL statement, I always say enter from customers. It's just nice to lay it out like that so you can read it better and click run. Cool. So this is my customers table and it has all my data about my customers. Now, what if we wanted to just see customers from London? So from the city, London. This is where you introduce a where clause. So, so directly after the from, we say where. We're going to say city is equal to quotation mark and London. And just type it just as how you see it and click run. Cool. And these are all the customers that belong to the city, London. And whenever you use a WHERE clause, and the WHERE clause is a field which is a varchar or char, i.e. it has letters, or a combination of letters and numbers, it must always be enclosed in quotation marks. Numbers by itself don't need it, just when you use letters. Now you can also search by specific phrases or combination of letters that occur. 
So for instance, maybe I want to see customers that belong to a city that has the letters WA in it. So any city must have the letters WA consecutively. We can use a like statement. So instead of equals, we say like, and we say quotation marks, percentage, percentage, and in between those percentages, we say WA and let's run it. Okay, and now you can see these are all the customers that have WA somewhere in their cities. Now the percentages on either side of the word that we're searching for basically means anything can happen before and anything can happen after WA as long as there's WA within the word. If we remove the percentage, we're just telling SQL to find a city that just starts with WA and anything else after it. And if we run that, Okay, we can see these are the cities that start with WA. If we put that percentage back in and remove this one at the end, okay, this is telling SQL to find any customers where the city ends with WA and there's no city like that. We can also do multiple where statements. So let's say select star from orders and let's run that. And let's say where order date, so where order date is greater than or equal to, let's do 9096-09-10, and let's run that. Okay, now we only have orders that occur after September the 10th, 1996. But well, we can also say, and maybe shipper ID, which is a number. So we say shipper ID, let's just say equals two, and let's run this. Now the result has orders that have only occurred after 1996, September the 10th, and have shipper ID two, but we can take it even further and say employee ID equals four run. And you can see only orders that are after September the 10th, 1996, which have shipper ID two and employee ID four. Order date is in quotation mark because dates and letters are always in quotation marks, but shipper ID and employee ID because they're numbers, they're numeric, they're integers, they won't have quotation marks. Okay, so before we move on, let's cover joins. And we're going to do a bit of theory here because it's important. We're dealing with a relational database when you deal with SQL. And because of that, we know that it's relational, which means the tables are linked. And that means that we can join tables. We have our orders table and we can actually join some customer information so we can see what customer actually bought and paid for a specific order. So what I'm gonna do here is cover the different types of SQL joins and how exactly they work. Let's say you have two tables. One table is an order table, which shows the orders that a customer has made. And the other table is a product table, which gives you details of the products that a store supplies. And we wanna join the two. There are four main joins that you can use in SQL. And before we start, if you look at the two tables, you can notice that we can link the two by a common key, which is product ID. So let's talk about the inner join. So the inner join produces only a set of records that match both in the orders table and the product table. So if we do an inner join on SQL, you'll see something like this. So product ID P1, P2, and P3 exist in the orders table and the product table. That's why we only see those three product IDs. The rest fall away in an inner join. What about a left join? The left join only selects data from the table on your left and brings in matching rows from the table on your right. So our final table, if we join left join, would look like this. We know P4 and P5 existed in the orders table, but it doesn't exist in the product table. So the final table has nulls for the product data but it's brought in all the orders. You can see P6 is on your product table, but it doesn't exist in your orders table. The left join won't bring in anything that is on the right table, in this case, the product table. So the left join will bring in all rows from your left table and only bring in corresponding rows that match the key in your right table. Now the right join is obviously the reverse of the left. It selects all data from your right table and only brings in corresponding data that matches with the same key on your left table. So it would look something like this. So we know P6 existed in the product table, but it didn't exist in the orders table. So the final table has nulls in your orders data. We can see that P4 and P5 exist in the product table and not the orders table. And P5 exists in the orders table and not the product table. Okay, let's do some joins. So let's backspace this and let's just have a look at orders. And with that, let's bring customers. 
Now this is where we're joining because we have a customer ID here and I want to see my customer data. And we're going to be joining the customer table to the orders table because our order table is the most granular table. Because customer ID occurs multiple times here, customer table won't be the most granular table, it will be order table. And we can do a left join because a left join will bring in all orders and any matching customers that have customer IDs showing up in the orders table. So we're gonna do select star from orders and let's do a left join, customers. We need to tell SQL what is the key, what is the link we're joining on. So we're going to say on orders dot customer ID is equal to customers dot customer ID. Now you notice I've added this in. What I'm saying here is bring in the customer ID field from the orders table, and it must be equal to the customer ID field from the customers table. This is because when you're joining tables, you can have fields with similar names, and then your SQL will throw an error. So whenever you're working with joins, it's nice to always reference the field by which table it belongs to. And let's run that. Awesome. So now we can see we have orders and we have corresponding customers here. Perfect. If we change this to an inner join, it won't do much, but what an inner join is saying is that we are bringing in only orders where the customer ID is present in both the orders table and the customer table. And why it will just bring in the same results as a left join is because I don't think there would be an order without customer ID assigned to it. it just doesn't make sense in terms of business logic, right? If there's an order going through, someone must buy it. Now, if we do a right join where our customer table is now a primary table, that won't make sense. Okay, so this is where we bring in all customers from the customer table and only if they made an order, it will show up. Which doesn't make sense because we can also have customers who haven't made orders. So someone can register maybe online and not make an order, which I think is what's happening here and why we have 213 records. If we scroll down, there we go. We can see that these customers here probably never made an order. And also if you do a right join, you'll probably duplicate rows because it's not your most granular table. So just remember that. Let's change this back to left join and run it. And now you can also implement your where statements here. So after your joins, you can have a where statement and let's just say where customer ID is equal to 65. So I'm telling the database I want to join my customer table to my orders table and I just want to see customer ID number 65. All right, it's giving me an error. It's saying an ambiguous column name and it's because I didn't put a reference here. So let's add a reference. We're going to use orders, customer ID. Okay, and now it's showing me what customer number 65 has bought. You can also do the same with employee ID. So let's just say employee ID is equal to eight and click run. And now this shows me all orders that are from employee ID number eight. We can also join more tables to this. So if we want to join more tables, I'm just removing my where statement and let's do another left join and let's do a left join on order details. But before we do that, let's just remove this, but copy it and just keep it on your clipboard. So control command C and backspace. And let's just check out select star from order details. Let's just check out order details. So I'm doing a select star from order details and running. Yeah, okay, I want that in. So I want this table to be joined to my order table and we can see it can be joined through order ID. So let's remove this and let's paste our old statement and we are going to do a left join. So we've joined customers to orders. Let's do a left join order details on and we are still going to join it to orders. So we're going to say orders dot order ID is equal to order details dot order ID. Okay, that is my common link. So orders table has an order ID order details table has an order ID. And I've just added the statement under the other left join and select run. Okay, and now we see some order detail popping up. Perfect. So with this SQL query that we have, we can actually aggregate information. So what if I wanted to see the total quantity, so the sum of quantity for this table, how would we do that? So instead of select star, we can say select sum, open brackets, and let's just say order details dot quantity and run that. That's just giving us a sum of quantity of the table. To rename it, we can just say as and any name we want. So let's just call it sum quant and run it. And now we see it's renamed. We can also do average. So if we change sum to average, 
and let's say as average quant. That's the average quantity. And if we replace this with min or with max, it will give us the min and max quantities. We just go back to select star and run that. We can also do a count. So let's just say I just want to count the number of order IDs there. We can say count order ID as order count and run that. So we're going to say count orders dot order ID as order count and run that. Okay, and that's 518. If we want a distinct, so unique, we can just put a distinct in here and now it gives me any unique order IDs and the count of that, which is 196. To explain that a bit better, if I just go back to a select star and select run, the first three rows here, doing a count on the first three rows, doing a count of order ID on the first three rows, it will return three. If I do a count distinct, it will return one because you can see this is the same. So there's one unique order ID. So that's the difference between count and count distinct. Okay, and then we can also do some group buys or some aggregations. So maybe I want to see the quantity for every city. I'm going to say select orders.city and then some orders.quantity as some quant. And because I'm doing a sum and I'm pairing it up with another field or another dimension, I need to do a group by. And when you do group by, you're just telling the database what you want to group by and I want to group by city. I want the result to show me the sum of quantity by city and that sum of quantity must be grouped by city. So per city, what is the sum of quantity? So that's what group by means. And if we select run, oh, it gives me an error. Oh, because orders, the orders table doesn't have city. I think this would be customers table. So let's just change that there. And yeah, customers. And then I think quantity belongs to order details actually. Let's check that out, order details, and run that. Yeah, okay, so just remember your reference tables. But here we get the quantity, or the sum of quantity per city. You can also do it for customer ID. So if we just change that to customer ID, and then the group by as well, and run that. So now this is a sum of quantities per customer ID. All right, and then if we go back to city, with T, and run that. The other thing you can do is order your data. So maybe you want to order it on city descending. We can use order by. Order by goes right to the end. We're going to say customers.city desc, which means descending. And run it. Okay, and you can see it arranges it from Z to A. And ascending is ASC. And this is A to Z. You can also do it here. So if we do sum quant, so order by sum quant. ASC, which is ascending, it'll be smallest to largest. So if we run that, so now this gets rearranged to have some quant from smallest to largest, and then descending would be largest to smallest. And then lastly, if you want to ever limit something, so maybe just show the first two rows, you can add a limit, and limit always goes right to the end. So just before order by, if you do have an order by, if I'm saying limit two, it'll just show me the first two rows. If I do limit seven it will show me the first seven rows and that is basic sql so before we close off let's just go over the structure of a sql query very quickly sql queries consist of two parts your compulsory part that you need always has a select and a from no matter what and then the optional part is where you do your filtering your joining any grouping by ordering limiting etc so select is where you choose what data you want to see so it can be select star for all or select specific columns from is generally your table. If you want to add a join, you can in your join clause and you can do multiple joins. Next one is always your where. So this is where you do your filtering based on conditions. If you're doing some sort of aggregation where you're finding the sum or the count or the average or the min and max, you have to use group by if you want to group by something. So if you want to see sum of amount paid per city, your city would be in your group by clause. Order by is just how you want to sort your results. And then finally, limit is how many rows you want to see if you do want to put a limit on there. And that's the basic anatomy of a SQL query. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it did help. Let me know if you like the style of video and if you want me to cover anything else. Please also remember to like and subscribe if you like the video. Thanks, see you on the next one.